Oops. <sighs> Hello. Uh, I'm, this is my way of learning Spanish. It's listening to you all do introductions in Spanish without speaking any Spanish. But uh, I hope you don't mind that I'm speaking English. I'm going to try to speak slowly. Uh, there is something I, I gathered uh, from your introductions, even though I don't speak too much Spanish, uh, is that not a whole lot of people know a lot about Rust or WebAssembly. So at least you, this hopefully is going to be useful and interesting. Um, so, yeah, hello. Uh, we are going to be talking about Rust and WebAssembly. Uh, my name is uh, Istvan Smorzhansky. Uh, a few people who have been here for the quantum meetup uh, a few days ago had a chance to, you know, practice that name. Uh, but Flocky <laughs> is fine already. Uh, SL, Softwork is, uh, SL Softworks is my Twitter handle if you want to tweet at me. Uh, I did bring a bunch of stickers, so later on, I think we have food, right? Yeah. So this is just like a 30 minute talk, uh, I think this is the only talk today. Uh, after your talk, feel free to stick around and stick your sticker your hands into the sticker pile. <laughs> also, I have some food. Um, oh, I forgot to, uh, to introduce, oh, uh, also, yeah. So what we're going to be doing is what to expect when you are web assembling. Uh, so we're going to be talking about what is WebAssembly and what is Rust and what does these two things have anything uh, to do with each other. Uh, how many web developers do we have here? Anybody web developers? Okay, any like C++, Java, something like that developers? Okay, a few, a few, a few. Okay, so, so you'll, hopefully you will learn something useful. And I forgot to, to mention uh, uh, my dear co-presenter, Bela, you could have seen him um, on screen earlier before. Uh, Bela and, and I uh, work for Mozilla uh, for their developer outreach team. Uh, we work for uh, the uh, developer relations team, so we do a lot of stuff like hanging out with people like you and talking to them about open web technologies and cool stuff on the web that you could do and we need your help to do. Uh, I'm also part of Mozilla Tech Speakers. This is like a initiative by Mozilla to support community members to uh, do exactly this, like go out to meetups and conferences and tell people about cool stuff uh, that happens on the web. And you know, in, the, in my free time, uh, Santiago already mentioned that I'm, uh, I came from, from Brazil.js. Uh, I presented a talk at Brazil.js about JavaScript and microcontrollers. So if you're into like Arduino and, you know, Raspberry Pis and this kind of hardware stuff, um, uh, that's my hobby, uh, hacking on JavaScript and uh, on hardware devices. Uh, but in the, in the daytime, when I'm not doing uh, evangelism and like developer relations work, I, I, uh, I'm a JavaScript developer. Uh, I used to do a lot of front end. I started out with PHP and like, you know, uh, uh, web shops and stuff like that. And I also teach, uh, so I'm like a t trainer. I mostly teach uh, front end or JavaScript. Uh, uh, and front end technologies in, in general. So that's about me. So yeah, we're gonna talk about, okay, who, who heard of WebAssembly before they saw this meetup coming up? Okay, who used WebAssembly ever? We're gonna see, we're gonna see, okay. Uh, we're gonna see why that might be a lie. Whoever uses Firefox. Okay, we'll, we'll get back to this. We'll get back to this. Uh, who was here for the first trust meetup? Any of the first trust meetups? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So you know a bit about Rust already. Uh, we're going to start with bad assembly, so bear with me. And we're going to get to the point when you know, we're going to have a look why Rust actually makes sense for web assembly, or like in general. But, but yeah, that's how you're going to go. So before... We, we talk about WebAssembly. Uh, uh, we will we'll have to we'll have to take a little trip down memory lane. So so what WebAssembly is WebAssembly is a 
uh, what they call an MVP, a minimum viable product. Uh, what that means is uh, it's uh, WebAssembly uh, came to be uh, from the cooperation of four big browser vendors. And to get four big browser vendors the size of Apple and Google and Microsoft to you know cooperate together or something, you will have to make a lot of um, a lot of uh, trade-offs and a lot of compromises had to be made. So uh, what ended up being is they shipped WebAssembly, and this is going to be a very important point throughout whatever you're going to learn about WebAssembly, is that it's not ready. It's not done. It's not you know something, here it is, you use it. If you're going to find, oh, I wish WebAssembly did this, or oh, I wish this was easier, and just always keep in mind that WebAssembly uh, was this compromise between all these giant companies uh, who didn't need to and didn't want to agree on every single detail. So they agreed on a baseline and said, hey, here's this base thing. Let's see what you can do with it. And we'll figure out the rest as you try out what we already have. But to actually see how this WebAssembly thing came to be, we actually go, had to go back, <laughs> way back, uh, into a different kind of technology. Uh, that, uh, well, sorry, uh, a different technology, but very similar kind of technology. And that technology was ASMJS. Who ever heard of ASMJS? All right, have you used, have you built anything with ASMJS? No, not. So ASMJS was this thing when, you know, uh, Several, several years ago, uh, I mean, Chrome, Chrome was like 10 years old, like uh, just recently. And you know, like what came with Chrome was the V8 engine. And you know, all this like new browser wars about JavaScript engines getting better and faster. That has been ongoing for 10 years now. It's, it's been a long time. So, so what happened is actually, uh, in the early 2000, uh, 2000s, uh, in the late 2000s, uh, JavaScript engines started getting better and faster, and they started doing something, you know, earlier JavaScript used to be interpreted. That is, you know, you read a line of code and you execute what it says. But, you know, that didn't cut it for, for, for the modern code that we were starting to write. So JavaScript engines and JavaScript runtime started getting faster and smarter. And how they did that is what they did, uh, is what a lot of virtual machines uh, that execute code do, uh, today, they jitted code. JIT means just-in-time compilation, which means it's not, you know, I'm going to read this code and execute what it does line by line or like, you know, token by token. But I'm going to read this chunk of code. I'm going to generate a machine uh, uh, representation uh, uh, byte code. So something that's close to the machine code, as, as close as possible, and optimized, as optimized as possible. I'm going to generate this chunk of code. Uh, and right before you want to call this function, I'm going to generate this compile representation and run it. Why is this important? Because obviously, you are now have a compiled version that's close to the machine representation. Uh, that is also fast. You know, you created a machine representation, so this code actually executes fast. Uh, so this just-in-time compilation made it possible for browsers to create JavaScript engines that were super fast. Now, a few years pass, and people realize that something is possible that wasn't possible before. And that something was generating large amounts of code and running it in a JavaScript engine uh, at comparable, uh, comparably very high speeds. What is this very high speed means? Very high speed means generating whole, whole games uh, worth of code, several megabytes of code uh, from a source code and uh, generating JavaScript code that is able to run pretty fast and that is able to run uh, on this JavaScript engine that is in your web browser super fast. This is the whole idea that's behind the ASMJS project is that JavaScript engines are now fast enough uh, to optimize some JavaScript code that you wrote 
uh, into a version of code that could be executed quite fast uh, just because they could do the JIT optimizations. So what the JavaScript engine does is it takes your JavaScript code that you write and it looks at your code. First, uh, it does something like a baseline. Uh, it starts in, uh, executing the code and starts gathering information. What it starts gathering, it starts gathering information about your type, uh, JavaScript code uh, types. So whenever you write JavaScript, we all know that JavaScript is a non-type language, so your variables are not going to have types uh, annotated on, in your source code, but they're going to have types attached to them uh, as uh, depending on how you use those variables in your code. What uh, very smart, uh, what uh, JavaScript engines did is they, they did the smart thing and they started realizing that usually people are not switching their types around, so if you're going to be using something as a number uh, and you consistently use a variable as a number, they can just treat it as a variable with an implicit type attached to it as a, as a number. So JavaScript engines were already doing this. What was the news for ASMGS is that ASMGS uh, actually made this explicit uh, by putting some uh, annotations into your code. The important part of this is JavaScript and ASMJS are the same uh, are the same language. JavaScript and ASMJS is still JavaScript, except ASMJS is a slight bit different. How how different it is? Well, uh, JavaScript engines know how to optimize uh, uh, type specific code. So what happens in ASMJS is that you take your JavaScript code and you annotate it, uh, this is the OR operation, if you have ever used JavaScript, uh, OR operation, uh, the one like a uh, pipe operator, uh, what it does, basically OR1 basically coerces your number into a 32-bit integer number and does bitwise operations, OR0 doesn't do anything uh, with the, uh, so this is, this, uh, this is not gonna change the, uh, the contents of the number. But this is a signal to the JavaScript engine that anything that's going to be the output of this operation is going to be an integer. This is still JavaScript code, but now you signal to the JavaScript engine that this thing cannot be anything except for a 32-bit integer. So this is what you are doing when you are doing this. What you are doing is making implicit things explicit to the JavaScript engine. So you are telling the JavaScript engine, hey, don't waste your tra time trying to figure out what are, what are the numbers, what are the types my variables are using during execution. I will tell you right ahead, right away, before you have to do anything, before you have to compile and run anything, that this is going to be a 32-bit integer. The good thing about that, now your browser engine, the JavaScript engine knows that with this 32-bit integer, uh, it can just store this uh, in four bytes in the memory and treat it as a 42-bit 32 uh, 32 integer throughout the code and execute operations, uh, you know, all kinds of operations uh, and mathematics on this variable as it was a four byte 32 32-bit integer. What this is allow you uh, is it allows the JavaScript engine to optimize this code uh, further than it would uh, be able to optimize code that could be anything. And this is the very baseline that made uh, ASMJS possible is because ASMJS code you don't write by hand. What you do with ASMJS is you take some type programming language like C or C++ and generate JavaScript code that has the same explicit types uh, marked up in the JavaScript code so when you ship it down to a web browser, the web browser uh, can take this JavaScript code, note down these explicit type declarations, and will be able to do highly optimized type-specific code for your variables uh, that you're going to be doing. Obviously, you won't be doing this like manually. You don't want to write all these like uh, type speculations by hand, but if you already have a type code like C++ on your hands, you can just create a compiler that generated this code. And this is exactly what they did. They created a compiler and script, and we're going to talk about this a bit later. 
And Scripton could turn your C++ code into JavaScript. That is regular JavaScript. This is just JavaScript. And the JavaScript engine could execute this code. There was one difference. If it was a good JavaScript engine, if it was a fast JavaScript engine, it could optimize this code further or even compile it ahead of time. Because now you don't need to run the code to know the types. You can tell the types ahead of time and compile these machine representations optimized for the hardware ahead of time. So before you even executed anything, what it, this made possible is exactly this, you know, compiling or complete applications like AAA game engines, like the Unreal Engine, and running it in the browser, you know, 10, 20, 30, and eventually 60 FPS, 60 frames per second, just running this JavaScript compiled code in the browser using WebGL as an output surface. And this, this, this particular thing is from 2013 or like around that time. This is like five years ago. Five years ago, you could run just using JavaScript. You could run a whole, you know, uh, Unreal AAA game engine with physics and, you know, uh, light reflections and all those kind of stuff in the browser without having to ship any extra plugins, any extra stuff, or having to use a separate language like Flash, Shockwave Flash, or a Java applet, or like anything else that you needed. All that you needed is a Java, uh, JavaScript engine that was compatible uh, with all these optimizations that ASMJS came with. So ASMJS uh, just did the same thing that JavaScript did. It could infer types, uh, and you explicitly uh, specify these types, and ASMJS could tell these apart. So ASMJS could actually get close to two times as slow as like native compilation, that is like 200%. So basically, you know, it only took uh, mscript and compiled JavaScript code to execute twice as much as it took highly optimized C++ code running on your native machine. Like, this is huge. Like, you know, uh, this means that this thing was actually possible. That means that if you had a computer that could execute 60 FPS uh, on uh, this latest game engine, then your browser would do 30 FPS. This is huge. And eventually, SMJS got down to uh, 33 to 60 percent uh, slower than uh, the native speed. Huge. And again, this is just JavaScript code running in a browser because, and for the reason that JavaScript engines got so smart that they basically became like optimizing compilers in the browser that did this on the fly. Uh, the very interesting and the important point about ASMJS again is just what I told you is you didn't need Java for this, you didn't need a Java applet, you didn't need Shockwave Flash, you didn't need plugins for this. This was just the JavaScript engine inside your browser. And again, this is ASMJS five years ago. There was one problem. There is only one problem is the, the one problem, I mean, it, there were multiple problems, but one of the biggest and more, most pressing problems were ASMJS just JavaScript. Now here's the problem. I mean, JavaScript is not fast when it comes to parsing JavaScript. Now this is great because usually, and I really hope you don't, uh, usually we don't ship like, uh, like multiple megabyte code bundles into devices, especially mobile devices. But you cannot really tell the Unreal Engine not to be 50 megabytes of compiled JavaScript. Because that's how it goes when you have a you know, 50 megabyte C++ bundle and you compile it to JavaScript, it's not going to get smaller and smaller, it's just going to be just as, just as large as it was. And what happened is ASMJS bundles became 50, 60 megabytes. And um, you, uh, like a good rule of thumb is JavaScript parsing. Again, this is not compilation to machine code. This is just parsing the JavaScript text into something that's, you know, in the browser's memory is approximately one to two megabytes per second. Now, you know, if you have a super fast desktop machine, like this gets, you know, way lower to like a few hundred milliseconds. 
But especially mobile devices, this can even go up to six seconds. You can have a one megabyte JavaScript bundle, push it onto a mobile device, and this is like a I think uh, Galaxy S4, S5, something like that. So a like you know you see the MacBook Safari uh, on the top with like you know about 100 milliseconds, and you see the bottom line uh, six and a half seconds. Parsing one meg megabyte of JavaScript into a memory representation. Now imagine what happens when you try to parse 60 megabytes of JavaScript. And then you, uh, you know, you parse all the JavaScript, now you need to generate optimized machine code from it. Now here's the thing, like you cannot really skip this, you know, 60 megabytes is, is a lot of 60 megabytes, compiling 60 megabytes is a lot. There is, there is something you can do about it. Because JavaScript is inherently slow to parse, you can go one level deeper and you can say, what if I created a binary format? You know, a binary representation of the same information that you could push down on the wire and that would be easier for the browser to parse. Because JavaScript code was not made for browsers to parse. JavaScript code was made easy for the humans to parse. JavaScript code is easy to understand, but it's not easy to parse because it's ambiguous on points, so computers have to work before they can easily parse it. So, hey, what if we did something and made this thing that was a JavaScript thing, but practically only consisted of all these operations over numbers? and figured out a way to efficiently transfer this over the wire in a compact binary format that was easy to parse by the browser. Welcome, you just invented WebAssembly. WebAssembly, uh, when it came out several years after ASMJS was already on the market, came up with the you know, idea or expectation of faster startup, faster parsing, and uh, Easier, uh, uh, easier ingestion into the browser. So what they came up with is they came up with this binary language that they managed to uh, put into a browser. Uh, this binary language uh, basically uh, compiles a bytecode for a virtual machine uh, that runs inside your JavaScript engine. Again, what ASMJS did was basically figure out how to use JavaScript uh, and select you know, all the useful parts of it uh, to be able to generate a low level, uh, close to machine code representation that was easy to compile and easy to optimize for actual hardware architectures. WebAssembly went one step further and they actually uh, came up with this idea of a JavaScript, uh, of like a virtual machine that basically did the same exact thing. Uh, so they figured out the lowest common de denominator between the JavaScript optimizer that you have, the JavaScript engine in your browsers, um, and the actual hardware. And they figured out uh, that, hey, here are some commands uh, that we could use uh, that basically we were emulating with ASMJS. Let's just make them actual commands and let's pack these into a binary representation that's easy to transfer to the browser. But at the end of the day, when, uh, when this uh, binary file arrives to your browser, the, uh, the exact same thing happens as happened with ASMJS. This binary thing goes into your JavaScript engine, and the JavaScript engine will compile, generate fast code from it, and you can call this code just like any of else, anything else. You can have uh, calls into this code uh, that can do computation for you. WebAssembly could achieve uh, about like 10 to 20 percent size gains, so it was 10 to 20 percent smaller. You know, take this into account that you can gzip JavaScript, right? So you didn't push 60 megabytes of JavaScript code through the through the wire. You only push like 30 megabytes of it because you gzip or broccoli or whatever compression you use it. Uh, you could use WebAssembly. And you could use the same compression and still get 10 to 20% less file sizes because, you know, it's a different dictionary. It's a different file format. It will have, you know, it, it will compress differently. Binary formats will compress differently. More importantly, though, 
WebAssembly happens to be an order of magnitude faster in parsing. The browser can parse your WebAssembly code like 10 times faster than it could use the, uh, could parse the ASMJS code. Now again, you know, if it took, you know, a fast desktop browser, you know, 20 seconds to parse, you know, 80 megabytes of Unity or uh, something, this is going to go down to 8 seconds. Now that's, that's a significant difference. What also happened is people were like, hey, this is so, this is a bit more different than JavaScript, so we can do cool stuff like actually have 64 bit numbers. So this is what they had. WebAssembly actually has uh, four types, like I said, MVP, four variable types that you could use WebAssembly. I mean, computers work with ones and zeros, so I mean, four types is already a lot. Uh, you have 32 bit integers. Uh, and 64-bit uh, integers, and the same for floating point 32 and 64-bit uh, floating point uh, numbers. WebAssembly only works with numbers, and in a moment I will, you know, talk about why this is important. But what you could do is you can now use 64-bit numbers, uh, which means you know if you're compiling C++ code that knows about 64-bit numbers, it will generate code that will use 64-bit numbers. And if you are going to be using this on a 64-bit computer with a 64-bit uh, browser, that is going to be including a 64-bit JavaScript engine, so it will optimize and compile the WebAssembly to use the architecture, use the 64-bit numbers to speed up computation, and you will get another like 5 to 10 percent, you know, execution speed gains. Again, WebAssembly is just like you know, uh, just like uh, ASMJS, ahead of time compiled. So when WebAssembly arrives to your, to your machine, you, uh, it will be compiled to a machine representation. When you're calling WebAssembly, it's going to be fast. It's going to be as fast as possible. It's not going to be uh, jittered. It's not going to be, you know, your browser engine is not going to be trying to figure out what types it has. So you're not going to see, you know, initially it's going to be slow and then it's going to be, fast, uh, be faster because your browser compiles and optimizes it. It's going to be fast from the start. Again, uh, it's an MVP. Uh, it, it was supposed to be efficient, fast, and uh, more importantly, and most importantly, safe. All these, all these things, they didn't uh, require a new uh, plugin, a new shockwave flash, a new something, uh, a new architecture in your system. Uh, all of this already runs in the safe sandbox of the JavaScript engine inside the browser. You didn't need to install anything extra. You didn't, uh, and WebAssembly has been built in security in mind. That means uh, it has a very limited feature, feature set to make sure that they avoid you know, ex escaping the browser sandbox. That means WebAssembly is safe, and it's meant to be safe uh, compared to all the Java applets and Shockwave flashes and all those other plugins that you used to have in your browser, and then uh, uh, every single uh, you know Pantheon conference used to uh, uh, gain code execution privileges on your computer over because you know there was a bug in the plugin of the Shopify Flash for like 15 years coming. This is all running in your JavaScript engine in the browser. This is true, tried and tested. And uh, all right and. And it uses the same architecture and same tooling that uh, was popularized by ASMJS. Again, ASMJS appeared like years and years ago, and it came with all this tooling. Hey, let's figure out how to compile all these code bases in, uh, in like uh, native uh, applications into something that runs in the browser. Now, that's one thing that you can compile C++ into something that runs pretty fast in the browser, so you can do computations about physics and you know, graphics and artificial intelligence and all that. But how are you going to present that to the user? How are you going to uh, play sounds to the user? How are you going to get input from the browser? All of these things you couldn't do in ASMJS and you couldn't do in, uh, and you cannot do in WebAssembly because all of these things require interaction with the hosting environment. WebAssembly or ASMJS doesn't have a graphics display, it doesn't have API calls to do graphics, it doesn't have music playing capabilities, it doesn't have input. What it does have, it has the ability 
to reach out to the browser environment, and the browser has WebGL for graphics, the browser has web audio for audio, the browser has uh, all kinds of input uh, events uh, uh, to get like uh, input access for joysticks and, and keyboard and mouse and all of those things. So what you do is you compile code and you generate some glue code between the browser environment and your, uh, and your gen uh, compiled code that will interact with this, you know, all these APIs that the browser only has built in. You're just, uh, you're just gonna be interfacing with those APIs, putting WebGL into the screen, you know, putting audio into the web audio buffers, or polling for input, or polling for network contacts, uh, network, uh, uh, network uh, data. So you can send and, and receive data through the network by WebRTC or HTTP or whatever your heart desires. All of these bindings, all of these things with the interactions with the browser had to be created, and ASMJS was a great place to do these. So what basically browsers did, uh, what basically uh, Mozilla did, is they created this tool almost uh, the moment ASMJS shipped called mscripten, that was basically helping you compile C++ code into JavaScript, but also generate all these bindings to let you access WebGL, Web Audio, so your things could actually show up and you know put uh, pictures and, and sounds and audio and in, uh, all of these things into the browser. Now all these bindings are not useless because they can be reused with WebAssembly because the two things are very similar. So now that you have WebAssembly, you get all, all the extras, you get the extra parsing speed, you get the extra execution speed of 64-bit integers, and all the future features that are coming to WebAssembly, like threads and uh, uh, garbage collector inter interactions. But you get to reuse all the tooling and all the things that were built around ASMJS and all these like compiled to JavaScript things. So you basically swap out, you just add one extra wasm equals one to the end script and compilation phase, and you get a uh, wasm uh, binary that does the same exact things, and you can play the game in the browser. Okay, so all the toolings you can reuse with WebAssembly, and these are toolings, uh, this is tooling that's been uh, developed for the past five to ten years. Uh, which you know, makes it pretty easy to create cool stuff in WebAssembly. For example, run uh, Netscape in a emulate, uh, emulated uh, environment in a web browser. I mean, running Netscape in Firefox, okay. Uh, this is Dan Callahan, uh, one of Mozilla's evangelists. He uh, presented this talk in uh, JSCon Budapest two years ago. Um, there is going to be, uh, the slides are going to be shared, uh, and there's a reading list at the end of the slides that you can uh, get to see the stock. It's a, a super fascinating intro to WebAssembly. So if you need a recap uh, and an intro from somebody else to WebAssembly, uh, this is your one. And they actually went even a bit further. This is like a tweet from two weeks ago. Uh, there is a thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually try to start it up and see, see if it works. This is going to take some time, though. Uh, did that work? I don't know. Let me see. Oh, okay, it started. Uh, uh, uh. I haven't tried it on this machine. It, it takes a bit of time to load. Aha, uh -huh. hello. Uh, maybe I need a... No? Oh, hello. Uh, that was fast. Where is the zoom here? There you go. Oh, there you go. Things are happening. Okay, maybe not that small. Oh, oh, that was quick. So what's happening here? Uh, this is an emulated x86 environment. This is uh, this was written in JavaScript. Then eventually an ASMJS version emerged, and now it's actually running WebAssembly. And wow, this was pretty fast. So uh, what it does, it actually emulates an x86 processor. That x86 processor is running a Windows 2000 uh, image that actually just booted the Windows 2000 image in the mm -hmm. browser. So we are still in the browser. And I'm going to try to start up Firefox. 
sorry, sorry. What, what was compiled into WebAssembly here is not Windows, it's the virtual machine. Yes, exactly. Right, that's Windows right. Windows is the original Windows. Exactly. So this is this is any image that you can get from Windows. The actual virtual machine uh, is like basically an x86 processor emulator yeah. and all the drivers and all the things. You can read about this. Uh, uh, again, the, the link is on the uh, uh, on the slides. But what happens here is they wrote an x86 emulator. Uh, with all the drivers, all the virtual things, again, all these bindings, you know, you don't get a screen, you don't get a display, but you can hook it up to a canvas in the web browser. All of these things, they, uh, they are made. Should I actually click it? I might have been slow. Something's going to happen. That's uh, not I know, it's Firefox 12, so, you know, if you need to you know, test something like 15 years ago, yeah, this is a good way to do so. Well, as, as fast as it started up, like Firefox is not really liking us. Anyway, uh, so yeah, and it, it loads, like there are uh, various uh, other machines, like you can use Windows 95, you can you know, use various like Linux kernels. Well, I'm just going to leave this here and maybe come back later, see if, see if it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, so you can do like really cool stuff with it, but when assembly is not a toy, it's very much not a toy. I mean, you know, sometimes it is a toy, but uh, uh, this is uh, this is Unity. Uh, let me see if I can. Wow, wow. What? Oh, okay. I have two VMs open. That that definitely not making it easier. Oh, there. Oh, hello. I think I think network is not not available in the browser. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't know if that actually works, but okay. That might actually load. I right? oh about home. So the home should load. Wow. Uh, I will never get back to full screen mode. Uh, <laughs> Or maybe, oh my uh huh, something is happening. <laughs> All right, cool. Now, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, so was it, uh, web assembly is not a toy, but it can be used for games because that was one of you know what do you need when you need like you know high performance and you know graphics performance and a lot of code. You know, one of the multimedia applications and which is a better multimedia application than a game. So what WebAssembly can do actually is it has uh, game support. Like you could see uh, the whole uh, Unreal Engine compiled to WebAssembly was one, uh, or ASMJS back in those days. Uh, Unity is a big proponent of WebAssembly. And um, anybody working in Unity or ever worked in Unity? Unity is this game, uh, like game framework, game creating framework uh, that lets you uh, create new games. And the important thing about Unity is uh, they just shipped a WebAssembly support, and they are actually, so they, they had ASMJS support for a long time. They shipped WebAssembly support recently, and they are actually going to be deprecating ASMJS support and going to be having WebAssembly support as a default. So you can just create a game in, in Unity. The, this is the thing, if you have never played or used Unity, create a game in Unity, and it has all kinds of exports. So you could create a iOS game, you could create an Android game, you could create a desktop game from it, or like, you know, not just games, but uh, any 3D experiences. And you can also do, what you can also do is you can also generate the WebAssembly bundle, which means that you can create an online experience from the same exact thing you just created, right? It has an export uh, for WebAssembly for a browser. But this is not, 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 not a toy. Uh, John Faminella, uh, he just said recently had this thread about this Fortune 500 company, uh, this insurance company, who were like using a lot of like server resources uh, because he had like thousands and thousands of agents who were submitting all kinds of uh, insurance requests uh, to this company, and uh, they had to you know go through all these requests and you know run them through some uh, several applications and you know, generate the, the final bundles from these applications. And what, uh, what happened is they realized that 
these, the core of these functions that they were doing on the server, they could actually extract it out. They re-implemented that core in Rust, and we'll talk about Rust in a moment, but it doesn't matter which language. They re-implemented this core in a low-level language. They compiled this low-level language into WebAssembly and shipped it to all these thousands of people submitting all these reports to them. So what now happens is when they click the button, uh, instead of sending the data to the server uh, as, a, as a whole and the server doing the compilation and, and the processing, the client itself uses the WebAssembly bundle to crunch through all these data, send it to the server. The server just has to do rudimentary uh, you know, checks on the data. But you know, in 15 seconds, you know, this client machine will crunch through the data, send, uh, send the data to the server, and the server doesn't have to do any more processing, just the rudimentary checking. Save 1.3 million, million, billion? Million dollars per year in server costs. And, you know, anybody who said they, they haven't used WebAssembly ever before, I mean, you could have an insurance with this company, I don't know. But uh, you can ha you have WebAssembly right inside your browser right now. If you're using Firefox, Firefox's DevTools is actually JavaScript. You know, Firefox's DevTools, the UI, is actually JavaScript and, and, and HTML and CSS. It even uses React. So it's, it's on GitHub, it's open source. You can literally, somebody was complaining about how uh, they tried fixing, I know, I know, I didn't want to call you up. <laughs> uh, they, they, they had this bug, in, uh, they switched to Firefox, tried out, and they had this thing that the DevTools was not responsive for something. You can actually submit a fix for it now because you just go check it out, you know, do the fix, pull requests in, and you can contribute to Firefox's DevTools. The inter more interesting or even more interesting part about that is it actually uses WebAssembly. Uh, when Firefox DevTools uh, shows you a compiled bundle, it does something that uh, is a mapping from this uh, original source code to JavaScript. And this mapping uses mapping files. Uh, so these mapping files used to be uh, processed by JavaScript. Now these, uh, these mapping files are crunched by, by WebAssembly. I mean, these mappings and these JavaScript bundles, especially for development work, can be like several megabytes. So this took a while, and they could achieve um, they could achieve um, like five to ten times speed ups uh, in the latest version of this, uh, just using WebAssembly code that is compiled from Rust and used inside the web browser. Uh, the source maps are basically now parsed using this WebAssembly. And this is what you're going to be hearing a lot, especially, you know, if you're going to be hearing a presentation like this. And there is this powerful thing inside the browser that lets you code any language and put it into the browser. Is this going to kill more JavaScript? Is my JavaScript? Should, I, should I be you know, learning Rust or whatever language? Because I, you know, nobody's going to be looking for uh, JavaScript developers. There's this talk by Gary Bernhardt that's called The Birth and Death of JavaScript. I can very much recommend watching it. Uh, it has very similar tones, and especially people who see this talk, they, the uh, web assembly kind of reminds them into this. But the short, uh, the quick answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, you need all these binding, you need all these like JavaScript interactions in the browser to make this work. So web assembly actually loves JavaScript. It actually works beside it and not against it. You know, and, uh, in Gary, yeah, Gary's talk, uh, he talks about 2035. So I cannot tell you if you know JavaScript is still going to exist in 2035. You know I don't think I can tell you that Earth is still going to be in one piece by 2035. <laughs> Let's hope. But you know it might happen by 2035, but not now. And you know just closing it up quickly because I was not supposed to talk this long. Uh, why why Rust and why WebAssembly? Uh, so here's here's the thing. Rust loves WebAssembly. Uh, Rust loves JavaScript. Uh, how Rust loves JavaScript is, is very easy because Rust loves WebAssembly and WebAssembly loves JavaScript. <laughs> so what happens here is, is you can use Rust to compile to WebAssembly and use this WebAssembly code in your JavaScript projects. Now the interesting part or the important part is there is a pipeline for this. Uh, like the Rust team is actually focusing to make this easy for you. Again, there is, you know, one thing that you can do something 
And there is one thing, uh, you know, it is one thing that you can do something easily. And you have the tools and you have the documentation, the information to do that thing. So this is exactly, uh, you know, the thing that happens here uh, is you take the Rust code, you take the Rust code, you package it up into a WebAssembly module. And this WebAssembly module you can use from the browser or even Node.js. Node 10, 10 plus uh, actually supports WebAssembly. So you can use WebAssembly in Node as well. Uh, uh, and there are several tools that help you out here. And one of the tools is actually uh, Wasm Bindgen and Wasm Pack. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you can generate a very small module in Rust, uh, generate the uh, WebAssembly version of it using the Rust compiler. The Rust compiler has like uh, this output for WebAssembly built into it. And here's the interesting part. You can publish that WebAssembly module into NPM and use it in any other project with just requiring that NPM package. So you have a Rust code, and this, this is actually going to get way easier. Webpack is going to have some, uh, already has some uh, uh, experimental support. You just drop the uh, Rust file into Webpack. And you can use the Rust file. Webpack will do all the compilation and Wasm and all the magic. You can you're gonna be able just to use the Rust a Rust module in Webpack just like that. Uh, so I already talked about uh, Wasm Pack that you can push this WebAssembly module onto onto NPM. The important part is uh, the interesting part is Wasm Bindgen. And I told uh, told you that you know Wasm only has numbers and only can interact with these things. Uh, so the browser, to actually be able to uh, uh, interact with uh, browser APIs, you will need something to translate. Now you can write this like bindings manually, but what's super interesting is what if Bindgen can actually generate uh, JavaScript bindings for, uh, for your Wasm code. So uh, what will happen here is you can write the whole application in, in, uh, in Rust, and you will have access to these browser features because Wasm Bygen can expose a lot of ins, uh, JavaScript uh, internal features into Wasm and will uh, be able to uh, help you with type conversions. So you can send like strings over the wire using Wasm Bygen without having to worrying about transcoding them into a memory buffer and uh, uh, decoding them back on the JavaScript side. All of these, you know, point to one question, why Rust? You know, and you are here at the Rust meetup uh, with not too much Rust experience. So why would you ever like try Rust or or, or use Rust in the first place? Uh, you know, everybody has different views on this. Everybody has different ways for putting it. My favorite thing about Rust is uh, the fearless concurrency part, and not necessarily the concurrency, but the fearless part. Uh, what, what Rust makes uh, possible, it is to, uh, it, it gives you low level tools and you know, high performance language uh, without you know, dropping you in, in the deep end and you know, having to figure out segmentation faults and like all kinds of like, uh, nasty issues that you would have if you would be trying to uh, find your way on low level language, C or C++, or, or like even going further. Rust is a, a Rust compiler uh, will not let you compile anything that would seg fault uh, mostly. I mean, you know, there is, you know, don't take this as a challenge, accept it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so Rust compiler will help you not compile anything. Uh, that, that is going to cause you troubles in your compiled binary. So if you actually can get something compiled in Rust, it's going to work. You know, it's like uh, how your Apple is supposed to be. Uh, it just works, except it doesn't. But whatever. Uh, it has uh, uh, Rust also has like a great story because it learns from from you know the ten years uh, before it. You know. JavaScript is great because JavaScript has NPM. You know, uh, it has a great package management story. You can like use code written by everybody else. You know, quite easily. Like this happens in Rust as well. Cargo is actually super nice and learns a lot from from uh, from what NPM did. So it has a great package management story. It has a minimal runtime. 
So when you actually want to use this, and we haven't talked about this, when you actually want to use this in uh, uh, WebAssembly, you're not going to package you know, the whole house up and you know, put that into a WebAssembly bundle because it has a minimal runtime dependency uh, that will uh, make this an ideal language to do. Uh, for example, Go doesn't really work here, except it does, but you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, because like garbage collected languages like Go or Python uh, are problematic to use currently in WebAssembly. There are some ways that that might change in the future. Uh, there are some proposals to uh, have a WebAssembly be able to reach into JavaScript's garbage collector, and at that point it's going to be much easier. Uh, but now it's currently not super supported. Uh, so there are a lot of things why you should. Uh, why you should uh, or use Rust for, for, for WebAssembly or, or in general. Uh, and uh, again, like the fearless part is my favorite point is, uh, there is a post about this, uh, I already mentioned this, uh, that uh, Firefox uses WebAssembly in, in its like developer tools. Uh, there is a blog post about that. There are plenty of uh, links in the reading list. I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, it's called Speed Without Wizardry. Uh, you could you could write hand optimized JavaScript code that you know that is you know closely as fast as WebAssembly because WebAssembly runs on the exact same processor. You know you would not have 64-bit types and sh uh, things like that, but you could write very optimized code that runs very fast and it's just JavaScript. What you would have to know is you know you would have to have like 15 years of uh, JavaScript engine in, uh, performance uh, experience. And a lot of internal knowledge of how your particular JavaScript engines work. And this is exactly what happened when this post came out that Firefox is starting to use WebAssembly. Vyacheslav Egorov, a very well known uh, JavaScript compiler engineer, wrote, uh, wrote a blog post about how he made the old JavaScript code work as fast as the new WebAssembly code. Now, the trick is, he was, uh, he was right. Uh, you could make JavaScript work. There is a whole blog post about how you could make it work, and he could make it work. The trick comes when the same engineer who did the original WebAssembly for writes another blog post, and he says, thank you for your help, and thank you for your suggestions about all these algorithms that you could use and all these things. We just took some of those ideas and made uh, the WebAssembly port five times even more faster. And again, you didn't have to know, you know, you didn't have to have 15 years of compiler engineering experience. Uh, you could make things fast without having to know all of those things. Again, I very much recommend all this blog post. It's an excellent read. Uh, but this is, this is what Rust and WebAssembly gives you. And just as a, you know, parting gift, you can compile Go to WebAssembly. Go now uh, has, a, has an export function. Which actually, what it does, it actually compiles the runtime into WebAssembly, so it will manage its own garbage collection and all the, uh, all its memory inside WebAssembly. Now, this is not efficient. Again, like this might change. This is gonna change in the future. There's already like proposals to uh, make WebAssembly be able to access JavaScript's WebAssembly, uh, JavaScript's garbage collector. Uh, but you can already do, use Go or a TypeScript. You know, WebAssembly is this compiled thing from a low-level language. So you cannot compile WebAssembly from JavaScript and make fast JavaScript code, right? Which is a problem if you don't know, you know, Rust or Go or any of the languages that you have the tooling for it. There is actually a way to compile TypeScript code into WebAssembly because what TypeScript has is exactly what you need, types. So TypeScript code can be optimized into compiling into WebAssembly code. So even if you don't know C++ or Rust or any of those languages, you can write small you know, WebAssembly packages uh, using TypeScript as a source. Uh, this thing is called assembly script. It's you know, very much experimental still, but you could write and output uh, generate WebAssembly code from uh, TypeScript without having to know anything about you know, TypeScript. And there is an uh, excellent tooling, as I mentioned, for WebAssembly. So I'm just going to click this one because we are running out of time. Uh, 
This is going to show you some WebAssembly code. Oops, or not. Oh, come on. Ah, there you go. So just, you know, just as a, what, what, what's what? Uh, so on the left hand side, that's the actual WebAssembly bytecode. You will see like the ASCII version of the same code. This is actually what gets transferred. This is the binary representation. Now the problem with the binary representation is people are not very good at reading binary. You know? I'm not, I don't know about you, but I'm not. Uh, so WebAssembly has this thing called WebAssembly text format. Uh, this right, this representation on the right means the exact same thing that's on the left. It's just you know, more human readable. And you know, if you did any assembly, uh, this is a, a what is called S expressions, which are basically you know if you did any Lisp, you will know what these are. Uh, but basically, uh, it is a abstract industry representation of the binary format that is uh, explicitly for debugging and, you know, you can hand write uh, assembly text representation and compile it to JavaScript. I don't know why you would want to do it, but I seen a talk in Java, JSConf EU a month ago that somebody did just that. So you could definitely do hand write that assembly just like you could, you know, write x86 assembly or, you know, Nintendo assembly. Uh, but you might not want to. Uh, you, you can use the text format though for, for debugging and uh, purposes like that. Uh, and the shameless plug. So, as I said, I do a lot of conferences and I'm going to be talking about WebAssembly and a bunch of other stuff at NodeConf Argentina in October. It's just a two hour ferry ride from here. And it's a nice conference with a lot of JavaScript and a lot of uh, Node people. And I also do a workshop there. So if that's your kind of thing, you know, uh, feel free to swing by. There is also going to be a Rust conference here. So if you know, this is some, some, something exciting, I can guarantee you there's going to be a lot of Rust and a lot of WebAssembly people around for Rust Latin. I'm going to be here, I know. Uh, so that's March. So feel free to pop by and ask Santiago for more info about that. And thank you very much for the help. Uh, I don't, you don't. Uh, you don't see my gift. Uh, again, uh, sorry. SL Software is my Twitter. If you want to know about a bunch of like super interesting and curious stuff, that's Moss Hacks. Uh, that's a Twitter account run by the Mozilla DevRel people. Talk.flat.is slash Mozim is the link to these slides. And like I mentioned, there's a reading list at the end of the, uh, the slides with a lot of cool uh, articles and videos. So feel free to check them. Thank you again. Oh, stickers, food, I guess. And yeah, and me. <laughs> I have one question about the engine that runs the web on the code. Uh, it is a still uh, like single thread? Yes. Yes. JavaScript. Yes. Because you mentioned like the Rust concurrency feature. Yeah. And uh, I said maybe use like web workers or something like that to achieve that. Yes. And uh, so. And just a 